Hello again, everyone. I'm Joe Pryweller, Conference Director for Plastics News. Welcome to Ask the Expert at the 2021 Executive Forum Virtual Edition. Ask the Expert is your chance to engage with professionals on a range of topics and interact with questions. Today's expert is Mike Benson, Managing Director of Investment Banking with Stout. Mike's presentation is titled, Planning to Sell Someday? Strategies you can implement now to drive value in the future. Mike will answer your questions after the presentation. To submit a question, enter it into the Q&A box on the virtual event site. Or if you are watching along on Plastics News LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube feeds, you can submit your questions via those platforms. With that, I will turn things over to Mike Benson of Stout. Mike, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to, uh, good to be here. I appreciate you having us. So as Joe mentioned, my name is Mike Benson. I'm a managing director at the Investment Banking Group of Stout. I've been with Stout for 20 plus years. My entire career has been working with companies in the middle market on merger and acquisition transactions. For the last probably 15 years, the primary focus of my practice, as well as several others in the group, has been working with plastics companies. So if you go to the next slide, so we within within Stout, within the plastics industry, we work with companies and typically privately owned businesses, potentially privately owned. But the bulk of what we do is work with private business owners, many of which is we've gotten to know uh, know at this conference as well as other conferences over the years. So within plastics, we look at various processes. So it could be injection molding, insert molding, blow molding, all various processes, and then within various end markets. So that could be medical, automotive, appliance, consumer products, and all these various processes and end markets, and frankly, very geographically diverse as well. So we pride ourselves in, in having worked on a num large number of transactions in the industry. And frankly, the, 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 the thesis behind this presentation is helping companies, helping business owners prepare for an eventual sale at some time in the future. So that's really what's driven this, is working with companies and learning lessons along with them as to how better improve their business and better improve. Next, firm, or next slide. So those of you that are not familiar with, with Stout, so Stout is a global investment banking advisory firm. So firm-wide, we are 550 people in 23 offices, seven of which are international. So we've got three offices in Asia and four offices in Europe. Within the investment banking group, which is where I am, we're 80 investment bankers. Um, we have several industry specializations. And as I mentioned, myself and David Evans and several others are within plastics. Some other things that our firm does would be transaction advisory, valuation advisory, disputes, and specialty services. So that's really stout essentially in a nutshell. So that's it for the commercial. Let's jump into the topic. And again, this really comes out of working with business owners and going through sale processes and, and really learning what could have gone better and areas to improve. So we want to talk about how, when, where, and when to prepare to, and, and really this is essentially if you're going to sell the business, but frankly, even if you never plan to sell your business, hopefully these are things that you could implement to better drive the value of your business. Some of these things can be done years in advance and some will be done closer to closer to the actual transaction itself. Um, so we're on page five now. So the, uh, the major categories that we're looking at would be historical financial detail, quality of earnings analysis, budget and forecast, operational, business commercial aspects, and marketing and legal. So let's jump into the details. So if we go to the next slide, start with his, historical and financial detail. So we recommend and we work with companies again uh, during the sell process. And what we've seen is that if you can consistently create financial reporting packages on a monthly basis, it's going to be extremely helpful for you and for buyers through the process. What I mean by that is if you think about it, think about running a business, a larger business, and you're having to report to the board of directors on, say, a monthly or quarterly basis. So you would put together a package that would talk about the financial performance of the business and any changes in the business historically, as well as any changes in the future expectations of the business. So if you get in the habit of putting these packages together, it'll give you a better picture 
to the business. And frankly, it'll allow you to document what has happened in the business historically. So we find that to be very helpful. The next, uh, the next item here, track and document changes in revenue and margin by customer. One of the things that we find is that clients are always shocked at how much detail buyers get into, how they want to slice and dice the various changes in the business. And this is going to be over the last two to three years. So literally, they will look at customer trends, preferably on a monthly basis, as back as two to three years back. And they will look at revenue by customer, margin by customer, and they may even dig into, believe it or not, skew detail. So if you're tracking this information, what we recommend is if you're going to sell in a couple of years or you know, regardless of when, start tracking that information on a preferably on a monthly basis and just make notes as to what changed in the business and why. So if certain customer went up or down that month, margin went up or down, was it due to resin? Was it due to operational issues? Was it due to, you know, what what caused that change? And just get in the habit of doing that. The other thing is, if you think about it, you can take that and roll that up into your monthly board packet. So that's what we typically see is that board packet is driven by that analysis of co- changes in customer, um, you know, again, revenue and margin. Next category, track all EBITDA adjustments. So what we mean by that is track changes in the financial aspect of the business. So that could be things like uh, expenses that you want to get added back as part of the process. It could be one-time changes in the business, like COVID, for example. What you want to do is you want to track those changes so that when preferably a buyer comes in, you want to get as much credit for that as possible. The more clarity and more evidence you can provide around those changes in the business and why, and more importantly, why it's not going to occur again, the more likely you're going to get credit for those changes in the business. And lastly, in this category, uh, ideally, you would have a couple years of audits by your accounting firm. So there's three levels. There's reviewed statements. There's, I'm sorry, there's, um, well, there's essentially there's reviewed and audit. So you want to have preferably audited financial statements, like I said, two years in advance. Not the end of the world if they're just reviewed, but it's better to have a couple years of audits. Then the next category over, quality of earnings analysis. So this is basically a deep dive into the essentially the EBITDA or the free cash flow and earnings of the business. There's two types of QVs. There's a buy side quality of earnings and a sell side. The buy side quality of earnings is what a buyer would do when they're doing diligence on the business. What we recommend, and this is becoming much more common, is you do what's called a sell side quality of earnings. You do that, you commission that report by an independent accounting firm just prior to launching the sale process. What that does is that gives us a deep dive into the financial aspects of the business, the earnings of the business, and allows us to have a much more credible, um, make a credible point towards adjustments, any adjustments. Like I said, could be COVID, could be expenses, um, could be revenue changes, things like that. That's basically what that firm does. And frankly, the good news is it's their job to defend their analysis. So it takes a lot of weight off the CFO later on in the process because a QV firm is, again, responsible for defending their report. One subcategory that I want to talk about, tax structuring planning. So this is something that most sellers wait until the very end to do. I always recommend even years in advance, you could go to your accountant and say, I'm thinking of selling two to three, four years. What are some things that I can do today to make it, to make it a much more tax efficient sale process, both for the seller as well as for the buyer? I will be shocked if there's not some changes that they would recommend to do in the business. The next category, budget and forecast. So budgeting forecast is not something that any small business business owners spend a lot of time on. Um, I will say that the more clarity you can provide to the buyer of what the future of the business is going to be, especially if it's a, a you know fairly uh, strong growth business, you want to provide clarity if you want to get credit for that. So the first section here, create and maintain a booked business schedule a backlog report, and new opportunity schedule. So those are three different categories. A book business schedule is essentially the business that's booked but is not launched yet. So you want to keep track of that bucket historically over time. The next is a backlog report. So that's basically the book of business that you have now and track that historically and into the future. 
And the last category is a new opportunity schedule. So that is, those are new opportunities that you're chasing, but not booked yet. And so theoretically, you would probability weight those. If you add those three categories together, that's going to give you a pretty good view towards your current business and then your business at least a year out. So that really is kind of the backbone of being able to put together what is the next section, which is develop a short-term projections for 12 months ahead. So ideally, you've got a rolling, rolling financial statement on a monthly basis that you can look back 12 months and you can look forward 12 months. And again, that rolling forward forecast on a monthly basis is going to be based on that backlog report. I realize you can probably only see 30, 60, 90 days, but you can use those trends to project to, to project out into the future. So you've got that rolling 12-month schedule that you can provide buyers. Another thing, it just, again, regardless of if you're selling or not, you get in the habit of doing that and allows you to more accurately predict the future of the business. The last one, create longer-term forecasts that considers recent performance. So ideally, you're putting together a forecast that is two to four, maybe even five years out. I realize it's hard to predict that far, but you get that first, you know, the first and second year, and then you just build on the trends of that into the future. So you end up with hopefully a three, four, or five-year forecast. And that's going to be based on booked business plus new opportunities plus new initiatives that you're undertaking in the business. Next page. So operationally. So this is something I, I don't think people really think enough about. So I, I have this label as <clears throat> facility house cleaning. What we always advise is walk through the facility, walk through the drive up to the facility and walk through the facility as if you've never been there before. Use a fresh set of eyes. Use a, like I call, through the buyer's lens and see what you could, what you could change to the business to improve on the curb appeal and the first impression of the business. It makes a bigger difference than you would think. We've had clients put new signage up. We've had clients pave, repave. We've had clients uh, put shrubs. Um, various things that you think sound silly, but it's that first impression of the business that makes a big difference. Another one operationally would be consider having a third party operational assessment to identify things that you can improve. Now, some of these improvements might be things that would happen well into the future. Um, there might be things that you're not interested in doing, but you've identified opportunities for the buyer of the business to make changes in the future. There are firms like Harbor Results and others. I think it's well worth the money to, to identify what you can make changes in the business as well as, as what the future owner can make. Another one operationally is consider a mock OSHA audit. That sounds like inviting the IRS in, but it's not. There's other, there's firms that do this. They will come in and do basically a mock audit to help you determine areas that you can improve. Buyers will focus on this. Uh, depending on the buyer type, like a, uh, a publicly traded company, for example, this can be a big deal. We had a deal uh, that was almost derailed because the buyer found what they consider to be $350,000 worth of changes that needed to be done prior to close. It almost killed the deal. We were able to get through it. But point being, had seller been willing to do that mock audit, we would have been able to find and determine some of those and de-risk the situation. But it's just something to think about. The last one here, continue to reinvest in the business. If you throttle back on capital expenditures prior to selling the business, buyers are going to find out about it. They're going to know. They're going to look back historically at your growth capex and your um, uh, basically improvement capex. So they're going to know where you're not spending the money that you could be spending. What they will do is if they realize you are not spending that maintenance capex that you should have been, they're basically going to take that off the purchase price because they're going to assume that they're going to have to make that catch up capex in the future. Generally speaking, our advice is to continue to run the business as if you'll own it forever. So keep that in mind. The one caveat to that would be major capex changes or, or major capex uh, acquisitions as well as things like adding facilities and things like that. Those are things that I would talk with an advisor, talk with your investment banker before doing that, because that may be a decision that you want to let the buyer make as opposed to you. But generally speaking, run it like you're going to run it forever. Business and commercial aspects. So uh, create a long-term forecast and vision for the business where the sky is the limit. I think a lot of business owners, they think too small. They think 
within their own financial constraints. What a buyer wants to hear is a buyer wants to hear what opportunities are available to the business. Again, sky is the limit. Don't think about your own financial aspect, but think about, you know, where would your customers want you to be? Would they want you to be in other facilities in other geographic regions? Would they want you to have other capabilities, um, be in other end markets? Think big, think beyond where you are today and where you could take the business in five years. That will generate excitement for buyers in the business. Continue to build out, if you need to, continue to build out the full management team. We see uh, a lot of sellers think that buyers are going to come in and either let certain people go or make major changes. Basically, it's, it's, it's quite rare to see major changes done with management teams in acquisitions, even if it's a strategic competitor. The reason for that is buyers need, generally speaking, buyers are going to need the management team, the existing management team to continue to run the business. They're going to have their hands full of their business. They need you to continue to run your business. So don't pull back on, on adding and upgrading positions within the business that you think need to be done. Last category here, implement an outside advisory board. That gets talked about quite a bit lately. I think it's great advice. It provides a owner a fresh perspective, uh, gives them advice on things to do and maybe ways to improve. And you know, hopefully that one of the advisory board members has been through a sale process before. They can always lend a good new perspective and be that second or third voice to kind of help you through the process and make decisions as you go. And they're just another person to lead through the process and rely on. Marketing and legal. So this one sounds kind of minor and silly, but update and refresh the website with current growth strategies and differentiators. Your investment banker will put together a what's called a confidential information memorandum. It's basically an overview of your business positioned the way we want to position the business for buyers, most likely to generate higher value, right? The first thing they're going to do when they get to, when they get that SIM is they're going to look at your website. And if they see a night and day difference between how the business is positioned in the SIM and on the website, it's going to, at a minimum, raise red flags. So I'm not saying you need to do a total revamp of your website, but just make sure that the keywords, the text, the pictures are consistent with how you want to position, how you want people to view your business and how it's going to be positioned in that confidential information memorandum. Next, review, this is relatively house, these are kind of housekeeping items. Review and update things like customer and vendor agreements, licensing agreements, software, things like that. These are relatively minor, but they can trip up and cause issues with the buyer. Lastly, again, another housekeeping, look at insurance policies and consider adding a DNO or director and officer's policy. This will give your um, senior, senior level management a little bit more comfort around not having liability in the transaction, either before or after the transaction. So if we go to the next page, just wrapping up. So a couple of additional things to consider. Net proceeds analysis. So depending on the size of the transaction, if it's a you know smaller company, sellers will be considering, is this going to generate enough proceeds for me to live the life that I want to continue to live once I've sold the business? A net proceeds analysis will do that. So that would be working with your accounting firm, but also probably working with your wealth advisor to determine you'd have your accounting firm do the net proceeds analysis. So what are, what is the cash available to you after all expenses, all fees, you pay off the debt, everything. What is that amount left? And then you essentially take that to your wealth advisor and say, this is what I'm going to get. Is this enough? If the answer is no, then you continue to run and grow the business. If the answer is yes, then it allows you to at least now have the ability to, if everything else is right, maybe now's the time to make a decision. But you've, the further you plan for that, the better, because if you're not at that level, at least you know you've got a couple of years to go. The next several, the next four of these are real estate related. So I think... Um, it depends on whether the, the real estate is owned within the company or if it's owned externally. If it's owned externally, maybe you want to true up and make sure that the lease rate flowing through is market rate. Or if it's owned in the business, you might want to consider it moving out. But those are things that I would run by your tax advisor and run by your investment banker to determine how am I best positioned to, to do the transaction as it relates to real estate. And the last one is FCPA or Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. This is really only applicable for international companies, but it can be a, a good way to plan well in advance if you have a facility in Mexico, for example, or a facility in China. 
those are things that you might want to think about because buyers will look into that as part of the process. So Joe, that's what I've got for um, prepared statements. Hopefully we've got some questions, so I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks a lot, Mike. Terrific presentation and uh, uh, lots of good things to consider and areas to consider that people might not have thought of when they want to sell a business. Uh, again, you'll see on the scroll at the bottom of your screen there, if you want to ask a question, enter it into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen on the virtual event site, or if you're watching along uh, on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, you can enter your question on those sites and uh, we'll get to those. Mike, I'm going to start with a question too. Over the, the, the last year, obviously, it's been an interesting one uh, with uh, yeah. something called the pandemic uh, facing all of us. How has that affected uh, companies wanting to sell a business and, uh, and, that, and that area generally? Well, it, it kind of depends on the company performance and it depends on the, the end market performance uh, that those companies, that that company serves. There are some companies that performed relatively well through COVID and there's some that didn't. I think it really depends on how your end markets were affected. I do think that there are companies that would have preferred to have sold last year that are now being delayed. And so I think that there are going to be companies that as we're coming up on the next few months, we'll have a lot of companies that are able to be basically COVID free on a trailing 12 month basis. So I think that is going to open up the opportunity for a number of sellers. The other thing I would say is that not necessarily related to COVID, but another thing that's going to probably move more sellers to market is going to be the potential for tax changes in the future. So I think there was a slowdown in M&A, but it snapped back probably faster than what I would expect with businesses that performed well. And then you've also got that tax aspect looming, mm -hmm. looming over the economy. Speaking of that, is that, is that, is that something that companies should consider selling now before a new, before new tax changes take effect or, um, or is it better? We are seeing that. Yeah, we are seeing that. Yes. For companies that perform relatively well, um, we have a number of transactions that we're launching on now that that their mandate is basically, let's get this done by the end of the year. And so uh -huh. you've got the next couple months to do that. Um, you know, too much, you know, when you get into June, it's going to be, you know, you put in more pressure on the process to get it done by the end of the year. Uh -huh. But it, it takes six, seven, eight months to do, to run a transaction from time of hiring the investment banker until the end. So you do need to plan ahead. Uh, I was going to ask you how long a typical managed sales process takes. So it's about seven to eight months generally. Uh, yep. So five or six on the short end, but you know, with some delays you add in there, you're probably getting to six, seven, eight months. It's pretty typical. Yeah, it's quite a while. Is there a way to shorten that sales process at all? The best way to shorten it is is some of the planning that we talked about. The the biggest one of the biggest gating items is is availability to financial information. In other words, the buyer is going to send a long list of financial information they want. And if the buyer already seller already has that teed up and ready to go, you can take a significant amount of time out of the process. Another way to save on time would be doing that quality of earnings analysis. So sales like QV. You've taken that month out of the process, you put it in the front, and now it's basically going to make it, you're taking a month out of the process later on. So those are the top two. Have all that slicing and dicing of financial information ready to go and have a sell side QV done. Ah. Probably the two top ways. Yeah, it sounds like it. And you mentioned uh, initially in one of your slides too about financials being important and keeping track, reporting it monthly and uh, having a lot of information in there. Is any information too much or do you want to report, any, report anything you can basically? Well, we, we will, your investment banker will be the governor of what you provide. So yes, you can sometimes overwhelm, but but what we would say is gather all the information you have, more is better than less, and then we'll determine when and what level of detail we want to provide, but at least it's available. The biggest, the biggest item that slows the process down is, again, is going to be availability, digging into your financial systems to get that information. If you're already gathering it as you go, you're going to have it at your fingertips. Yeah, that's that's good advice. Uh, how long is the transition period for the buyer looking for from the seller operator? Is there is there much transition period between the two once this once this takes place? Yeah, so that's another important factor. So if you have a business owner that says I'd like to be, you know, we we recommend they look a couple of years into the future because you know pick an age. If they want to be done and retired and completely gone by sixty five, for example, that transition period that most buyers are going to look for is going to be around a year, depending on how crucial they are in the business, maybe they've transitioned the CEO title or president title to somebody else, and it can be shorter. But if that's a business owner that is 
involved in daily operations, they're going to want at least 12 months. If you do less than 12 months, it could neg negative, negatively impact value because you'll have certain buyers like private equity that will be uncomfortable with less than a 12 month transition period. Speaking of which, are you seeing uh, more, more, more activity being done on the private equity side or on the strategic side as far as uh, buyers looking at a business right now? I think it's both. So there's generally three categories of buyers is pure strategic buyer, which includes international hybrid, which is a strategic buyer owned by private equity and pure financial buyer. All, categ all three categories are very aggressive. The most aggressive would be hybrid buyers. Those mm -hmm. are, again, strategic, own, own, st strategic companies owned by a private equity fund. The reason for that is they've got a finite period of time that they're going to typically own that business five to seven years. And so with the COVID uh, impact from 2020, they're probably struggling with organic growth. And so the best way to grow beyond that is going to be through acquisition. So, But we're seeing very strong interest from hybrids, strategics, and pure financial buyers. So all categories are, are very aggressive buyers right now. Do you need to repair differently for a sale depending uh, who you're thinking about selling to or does it make any difference? No, that's a really good question. The main, the main would be management. So the management team, you would want to have a fully built out management team, a deep bench for private equity. They're the most sensitive to that. A strategic buyer um, can live with maybe some holes in management and maybe some areas that need to be improved. A financial buyer is, is really going to need that full team across the board, operationally, accounting, uh, marketing, you know, that whole segment, because the, they're investors. They don't, they can't run a business, even if they had to. So that's probably the one nuance is for private equity buyers. But generally speaking, beyond that, they're, they're, it's pretty much all the same. Great. Again, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can do so by entering it into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen or via your social media platforms. Uh, here's a question. What are some of the most common reasons that a sales process fails or is delayed? Yeah, that's another good question. So and we get that quite a bit. So um, the biggest reason that a deal gets derailed, delayed, or outright fails is going to be um, financial performance of the company. In other words, the company through the managed sale process, the, the seller starts to miss their financial projections. Maybe a large customer has left or maybe just a downturn in the economy. But what happens is seller has expectations and value where they want to be. And if we're missing numbers as we go on a monthly basis, it, missing revenue, missing EBITDA, it's going to be a red flag to the buyer. And at a bare minimum, there's going to be a delay because they're going to have to determine why are you missing numbers? Why are you coming lower than what you expected? So if we can hit numbers and we've prepared the business well, the likelihood of it not getting closed is very low. It's that upfront prep and then hitting your numbers as you go is a recipe for very likelihood of getting the deal closed at that value or hopefully higher. And I imagine if you're missing your numbers, uh, you, you, you need to explain that fairly well too, yep. right? In your financial reporting. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's interesting. So you seem to keep it up even during COVID, I guess, anyway, uh, keep it up best you can anyway and do that. Um, well, you just want to prove out why, what impact COVID had. And a lot of companies in this uh, industry got PPP money. So they needed to do that anyway. So to get that money, you had to prove out where the money was going. And so that kind of forced these companies to track the impact that COVID had. So you had facilities that were shut down for one, two, three months. And they were forced to track that impact on their business. So the good news is a lot of that information is already available. But like I said earlier, you want to prove out the changes in your business and why. And if you missed your numbers, like you said, Joe, they're going to ask questions and you need to prove why. Doesn't mean the deal's dead. It just means it's going to raise a lot of questions. Here's a question that came in. Uh, is there anything about a sale that that uh, would surprise sellers the most? Um, what anything anything that might not not have been expected? I guess with this, um, I think the amount of time and energy that it takes from them and some people on their management team dedicated to that. So it, it's it's a time. We our job is to limit that as much as we can. But there's there's some that we can't. Um, you know, that just management needs to be involved. The other thing I would say is the level of detail that buyers go into both financially as well as trends historically in the business. Like I talked about, you have trends in customer revenue margin down to the SKU level. Sellers are like, are you kidding me? They want to ask questions one, two, three years ago. How do I know what happened? So it doesn't, you know, it. it's better to be able to answer it. It's not the end of the world if you can't. 
But that's why if you start tracking it now, you're able to answer that right off the bat and you've got the data for it. But that's what I would say is they're surprised at how much diligence goes into it. Oh yeah, for sure. A lot, lot, a lot of detail. Uh, can you keep a sale process confidential? Is, is that is that important? And if so, uh, how do you do that? Yeah, most most sellers is extremely important. We definitely can keep that confidential. It really goes down to limiting the employees within the company that know to a very core group of management. So you want to keep the people within the business knowing about it very small. And you're certainly gonna, not going to make convers you know have conversations outside of that. So it's keeping a very small group, going to the best buyers only, keeping them confidential, and then really keeping that small group within the company until much later in the process. So we're typically able to have a a fully confidential process up until the day of closing. And a lot of times, most often, a lot of the employees are surprised that you know that that even happened. So. It comes down to working with management to come up with that story internally, because we always say there will be questions. There will be people that come into your office, shut the door and say, Joe, what's what's going on? I see strange people walking around. You want to be able to not outright lie, but you want to be able to at least still keep it confidential. And there's there's stories and a script that we would put together to, again, balance that so that they're not, you know, receiving confidential information, but you're not having an outright lie. But there's there's definitely ways to keep it confidential through the entire process. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one last thing with that too is 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 you mentioned that you got to run your business like you're going to run it forever. Um, yep. How 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 much do you continue to look at expansion and innovating and other things during this process? Um, do you want to do some of that still? I mean, do you want to invest a lot or do you want to just uh, just keep it keep it fairly moderate? Well, that's a good question. So it depends on how long in the future. So if you're thinking about selling three to five years out, I would say you want to be as aggressive as you can be, you know, with your own financial limitations. So um, if the closer it gets, if you're talking about within a year, then I would say you still want to continue to make the CapEx as if you're going to do it. But would you make, make a major plant expansion? I would probably just wait. Would you add a facility? Would you add, would you do things that maybe a buyer might say, you know what? I probably wouldn't have done that because maybe I have a facility somewhere else. So you didn't need to add that facility in South Carolina because I already have one there, or you didn't need to expand that your factory because I've got room in my factory. So there would be things that you just need to think through. Would a buyer potentially say, you know, I'd like to make that decision on my watch versus you making the decision. And then maybe I disagree with it. So general CapEx, I think should continue, but it's like you said, Joe, it's a bigger, the bigger moves, the bigger the moves they get, the more likely a buyer is going to say, I, I'd prefer to make that decision on my watch. But you do want to keep track of, and it goes back to that presenting the growth opportunities, you want to keep track of what opportunities you are seeing so that you can pre present those to the buyers to say, listen, this is an opportunity for the business. I have chosen to not pursue it for whatever reason, but these are opportunities that you can pursue when you own the business in the future. And that drives excitement around having multiple opportunities to grow the business under their watch. Great. Well, coming in from the audience, and it deals with Stout uh, directly. Does your team have buyers looking and sellers looking, or are you able to bring those together, or do you help with the with the process once the buyer and seller have found each other? Well, we do both. I mean, our preference is to run a managed sale process. We're advising the company, hopefully a year, a couple of years in advance, to determine when is the right time to launch, and then manage the, the entire process um, going to the approved buyers. But do we know of buyers that are looking? Yes, we, we, we definitely, you know, we're in contact with a lot of plastics companies, most one way, shape or form, especially those that like to do acquisitions. So we do know of companies that would like to do acquisitions. And we do also know of companies that are at some point over the next few years are eventually want, want, want to be sellers at some point, I guess. So yes, we're aware of both good buyers and companies that want to sell eventually. If that well, answers the question. Uh, yeah, I think you did. Um, Mike, uh, do you have any parting comments or final words you want to leave uh, the audience with? Um, so I, I think that the whole premise of this presentation is around preparation. And I think that what sellers realize through the process is the amount of time and energy it takes, but that can be dramatically reduced by the amount of preparation that you put in upfront. <clears throat> so that would be the main, hopefully the main takeaway, the more preparation, the better. <clears throat> Good, good advice. Hopefully that helps. Uh, definitely. Well, I want to thank Mike Benson, 
of Stout for a great discussion on strategies to drive value in the future and what you can do to help uh, get ready to selling your selling your business anyway. If you have additional questions for Mike, uh, please feel free to reach out to him directly at the email address listed on the screen below. Uh, don't forget to tune in at 2 p.m. Eastern time today for our next session at the 2021 Executive Forum Virtual Edition. We'll hear from Emily Tapaldo of the U.S. Plastics Pact on what the plastics industry must do now to answer today's sustainability needs. That will be followed by a session from Leon Farinick of Carbon Light Recycling on expansion during a pandemic. And then we'll have our annual Best Places to Work ceremony. Also, for those who have registered in advance, our day will end with our St. Patrick's Day happy hour with an experienced mixologist giving us an interactive session. Uh, bottoms up on St. Patrick's Day anyway. I'm Joe Pryweller with Plastics News. Thanks for watching and have a great day.